what was the what was the army and the 75th like from your perspective before 9-11 happened 9-11 happened well um what was the 75th like it was like a boy's dream to come true man um I, again i didn't know what i signed up for you heard all the stories you know basic training they put us in, in our base they put us all in one platoon the guys with the rip contracts you know the pickup was awesome as intimidating as it was intimidating as fuck, man it was awesome you know and they ran us down to the you know they ran us down to the rip in a, you know uh area and they closed the gate in and and it was there it was there when i was where i was exposed to men that i've never seen before right behind that gate and i was addicted right off the bat i was addicted man um right off the bat yeah and, and, and you know the you know the arena i mean that's what it was it was an arena but it yeah, wasn't yeah. the it wasn't the it wasn't the rigors of the arena it was the fact that i made it that far and i'm like what's the limit man like if this is you know so uh and so it was really good um what's up everybody before we get into the episode with command sergeant major retired al Pertus, i thought i'd just hop on here real quick and let you know today's episode is going to be a two-part episode uh we Al and I covered a lot in the over two hours that we talked, and I thought it would be best for you, the listener, to break it down a little bit. Uh, definitely best for me, the uh, podcast producer, to break it down and, and get it to you guys. But I really want to, I just wanted to emphasize how great this conversation is. Uh, great for army leaders to hear, future army leaders to hear, leaders in general to hear what Al has to say. This is the definition of vulnerable and transparent leadership in my opinion, and one of the best episodes uh, I've ever recorded. So lock in, get out a pen and paper if you can. Uh, if you're on the treadmill or in the car, get ready to take some mental notes as we delve into episode one with Command Sergeant Major Retired, Al Pertus, and be sure to check it out next week when we, uh, when we finish our conversation. Welcome to the Leading with Vulnerability podcast. I'm your host, Yuma Barnett. You guys are all very familiar with me. And today I got a guest who used to torture me back in the day. I'll say he put me through the Ranger Indoctrination program uh, many, many moons ago. Uh, I have great respect for Al Pertus, Command Sergeant Major, retired. I would give a detailed introduction of Al off of his bio, but we'd be here for the first hour of the podcast explaining Al's service and everything he did for this country. So I'm going to make it short and sweet, and I'm going to hand it over to Al to introduce himself, and we're going to get into this conversation. Hey, well, good morning, Yuma. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the introduction there, and uh, you know, the honors, the honor to be on this thing is mine, man. You, uh, I'm starting to realize um, some of the answers. Uh, to the test to kind of when you get out the army, like, how do you give back? Um, and then, you know, just the, just the title of this podcast, transparent leadership. Um, uh, I mean, you hit home with that. Uh, and so when, when I caught wind of it and, uh, and you know, the question is, is what is transparent le leadership? It surely made me reflect a bit. Um, and for what I understand, uh, you've had some rock stars, uh, on this podcast and I, and I sure ho hope I, uh, at least touch, uh, the bottom of their, you know, their, their performance there. And I'll try and give as much as I can, but it, it truly is an honor um, to be on here. Uh, and I think uh, what you're doing right now is right um, and, and for the rest of us out there. And, uh, you know, you can take this anywhere you go and listen to it. Um, yeah. And so thank you for this opportunity. I'm extremely humbled um, to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm just super proud that uh, I get to tell my story a little bit, man. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for those kind words. Thank, thanks for coming on and taking the time. And uh, we'll kick it off with the question everybody's get, everybody gets, the Leading with Vulnerability podcast. Uh, what is your definition, Al's definition of vulnerability? Okay, so, uh, well, without, without, without actually defining vulnerability first, I, I guess you got to, you got to put yourself, um, you have to put yourself in a position to be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I thought about that question a little bit and I, and I thought about the different ways I would answer it. Um, but I would be wrong if I didn't mention the way I grew up, um, a little bit. Um, and so, uh, to that, um, you know, I, I lived in a, uh, we didn't have, we didn't have much, but we had the, the things that you, you need to do. And we were taught, um, you know, uh, at the youngest level to respect the elders and stuff, you know, and, and all that good stuff. But the uh, most important was to listen. Um, 
to listen and pay attention to what's going on around you and understand and absorb everything uh, before you speak. Um, and so fast forward uh, in life and, and, and some you know lessons. And, and now, I mean, I'm 48 years old today. I think to be vulnerable is to, to completely understand the world around you and the people that you're working with. Um, and don't be afraid. Um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, as your best judgment uh, should be your strength based on your experiences in life. And I think the more uh, mature I got in the, in the army or as a leader, whether it's at my a leader in my house or a leader in the army or a leader for anybody outside, um, I became more vulnerable as I started to gauge my audience. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, being vulnerable um, is not being afraid to, to do the right thing. Um, it's not it's not being afraid um, to take it on the chin if you made a mistake while while you know what was best to do the right thing. And it's also being vulnerable is also showing um, it's showing strength in front of the people you lead. Uh, it's also being an example um, uh, to the things. I mean, you're supposed to be the sponge um, to ricochet as much as you can off of the team. Uh, and, and if you're not vulnerable, you could easily absorb that. Yeah. Um, you know, humble, being humble, you know, having humility. Um, and to be c- completely honest with you, if you master those things early in life, um, the character of people becomes common and you start to recognize different characteristics in people um, throughout. Um, and so I've, I was taught to be super respectful to your elders, to the people above you that are in charge of you. And, uh, and I think that put me in a position right off the bat when I joined the army to truly respect the people above me, right, wrong, or indifferent. Their intentions were always good and to be vulnerable to, to absorb all that. And I think absorbing all that is what helped me make better decision as, as a leader, you know, decisions as a leader later on in life. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I don't think there's one right or wrong answer to what vulnerability means to people, but I love it. Is it put yourself in a position to be vulnerable? What you said there at the beginning, it's absolutely true. And when I talk to you know younger service members and stuff and I try to explain vulnerability, I'm like, hey, didn't you feel vulnerable the first time you stood up in front of a a, a group of people you're about to throw out of an airplane and give action, you know, oh, yeah. actions in the air and actions during descent. You were vulnerable at that moment, but when you completed it and did a good job and you put in the work and the rehearsals, how good did you feel about, you know, being in that position? And I, I just love that. You got to put yourself in the position to be vulnerable. And uh, I, I love that definition of it. So if yeah, I look you, at your, yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, if you'd asked me when I was a staff sergeant uh, or a young NCO, if I was vulnerable, I'd say absolutely not. Right. Cause it, yeah. I would have thought it was a, a sign of weakness, even though I was vulnerable, yeah. I, I completely didn't understand it. Um, w- which is interesting, right? Because you go back in time and like, as a leader, uh, especially as a, as a sergeant major in the army, I was always like, how can I get those type of messages through the youngest leaders? Um, it's just like anything else just through repetition, you know, yeah. uh, and talking about it. So that, uh, yeah. a great question, man. Uh, I would, I would say, I mean, you could talk all day on that. Yeah. 100%. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if I, if I look at your bio here and I, I it dates back says 1993 is when you, when you came in the army. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's a little bit ago. I was still running around, uh, you know, small town to Mexico trying to figure out what I was going to do after high school in 1993. So when you joined the army, what, what led you into the army at that time and place? Cause I think in a lot of ways we're kind of going back to that same era era now in the military yeah. as why people are joining and what they're doing. And, and then when you joined the army, why'd you, why'd you choose the 75th? What was the route to the 75th like back in the, in the early nineties? Yeah. So, uh, I never had anybody, um, no one in my family said, you know, join the army. Uh, however, uh, my dad did five years and got out. He never talked about it. You know, my mom, mom and dad separated. I was about five years old. And so, um, I, you know, I start to wonder if that was a, it was a like kind of indirect influence, uh, if you will. Um, but my initial take was when I, uh, you know, I was the first uh, in the family to graduate high school. Um, and that was a, that was a, in the family, that was a feat in itself. Most of the, actually all the men would stay local, work locally and support the families. Um, and uh, the, I've been exposed. I think exposure, I got to talk about exposure for a minute. Um <laughs> You got to touch the magic every now and then um, in life. Uh, I don't need to, I don't need, like when you, 
like my kids, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to expose them. I want to expose them to the things that are going to be great to inspire them. Right. And when you don't have anything in life, you know, or you don't have much, um, sometimes the small exposures, like when you see someone in a suit, you've never seen it before. Or like my dad, my dad was, you know, he was doing stuff. Uh, he got, he got pretty high up with McDonald's. He did 29 years with him, but he, I remember one time he brought me to Florida and it was like this convention or so, I don't, I don't know. And then I remember walking in and seeing like there was people on stage and, you know, he was up there and everything. And it was inspiring as a kid. It was intimidating, inspiring. And I've never seen anything like that. And it was a snippet, you know, like real quick, you know, real quick thing. And I never saw it again. Um, and, and so I'm trying to figure out why I picked the army. And I just I always, like I, I think I said this at my retirement. I just want it better, man. Um, you know, I mean, I just want it better. I wanted it, I, I mean, I love the way I grew up. I wouldn't change it. Um, but I just wanted I felt like I had a capacity to do more. Um, and I mean, I'll be honest with you. I signed up with the Marines first. <laughs> I was, I was going to go delayed entry to the Marines. I wanted to do something. Um, I loved the way the guy looked. He was a hard ass and I uh, had a nice uniform and I'm like, I'm going to go be a Marine. Like I, I know, you know, I'm going to be a Marine. And then uh, I ended up talking to my army recruiter and uh, he said, Hey, I can guarantee money for college. You know, they throw the college money, which I haven't used yet. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, it's, it, well, I mean, I'm doing my college, but, I didn't use it. And I thought I was going to do four and get out. Um, but he also, he's like, well, what do you want to do? You scored pretty good on the ASVAB. I'm like, I don't, I don't know, man. Like I want to do something cool. You know, I want to, you know, I want to be adventurous. And so he showed me the Ranger video, man. And, uh, you know, looking back, I'm pretty sure it was a Ranger school video. Um, and you know, he little cast it and jump out of the planes. And I'm like, I, you know, I want to do that. Um, I, I'll be completely honest with you. I did not know what I was signing up for. Um, you know, I was, you know, just a, just a kid on the streets, man, you know, and I wasn't a gangbanger or anything like that. I was just a good kid, you know, on the streets, you know, who didn't have a lot of money, you know, come in when the street lights are on, go outside when the sun's up, right. Outside kid. Um, you know, we didn't have much, so you had to be very creative, uh, to, to keep yourself entertained. Um, but I just wanted more, man, you know, and I, and, and so that's why I joined, um, you know, there, there was one guy, there was a guy that was, uh, what was his name, man? A guy named Joe Parks, I think his name was. He was in our high school, and he was a linebacker for our high school football team. You know, I mean, like, ooh. He ended up going to 175. Um, and he came back. You know, he came back, and recruiter brought him in. And uh, we did the Pizza Hut thing, you know, to sit down, and he talks to you. I mean, it's like, there's no way. Like, I'm signing up for this. Look at this guy. Like, there's no way, man, but I'm going to try. You know, I'm just going to take a stab at it, right? No, you know, I, I guess – I guess I was living the motto, you know, no, no risk, no reward as a right. kid. Um, but I didn't know what I was doing, man. I just, um, and I surely didn't realize what I had inside of me. I think the Rangers pulled that out of me. I surely didn't know what I was capable of. Um, but it was a shot in the dark. Um, it, you know, the, the, the contract actually got canceled. Um, when I was getting ready to ramp up to go, the, the recruiter called me and he's like, Hey man, your Ranger option got canceled. And I'm like, what? And so I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. So I remember calling my dad and uh, he's like, hey, is that he goes, don't join unless you get what you want. So I'm like, OK, very vague. He hung up the phone. I'm like, OK. And the rest was me. And I, and I called him back and I was like, hey, man, I'm not joining unless I get the Ranger off. He's like, oh, you already swore. I'm like, I don't care, man. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving unless I get it. And so I fought for that. Uh, and I had a 109 GT score. They got a, I lost you. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. And I had a 109 GT score. Um, and, uh, and so I got a waiver for the 110 to get in, you know, and improve it later on. But, uh, so yeah, man, I joined, I, I hook, line and sinker. I was, I was on a mission. First time I ever flew an airplane, uh, in my life, joining the army. Uh, you know, I left with a, left with a couple things and I even, I even did my head like this, but I had to get another haircut and basic anyway, but you know, I thought I was being smooth, but no. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> and as they say, the, the rest is history. And we're going to delve into that history a little bit here. So you I joined the army pre 9-11, barely. I, I got to 175 right before 9-11. You joined obviously quite a ways before 9-11. Yeah. Something I experienced when I was there, there was a lot of Rangers that were about at your career phase when 9-11 have it happened, joined early to mid 90s, and they were they were done. They were like, I'm out. It's never gonna happen. I'm never gonna go get to, you know, put into action everything that I've trained to do for all these years and put my body through. Right. And there were a lot of guys that, that got out of the military. Um did you see that? Did you have some of those feelings when you were in? What was the what was the army and the 75th like from your perspective before 9-11 happened? 9 happened? Well, um, what was the 75th like? 
it was like a boy's dream to come true, man. Um, I, again, I didn't know what I signed up for. You heard all the stories, you know, basic training. They put us in, in our base. They put us all in one platoon. The guys with the rip contracts, you know, the pickup was awesome. As intimidating as it was intimidating as fuck, man. It was awesome. You know, and they ran us down to the, you know, they ran us down to the rip and, you know, uh, area and they closed the gate in and, and it was there. It was there when I was, where I was exposed to men that I've never seen before right behind that gate. And I was addicted right off the bat. I was addicted, man. Um, right off the bat. And, and, and you know, the, you know, the arena, I mean, that's what it was. It was an arena, but it yeah, wasn't yeah. the, it wasn't the, it wasn't the rigors of the arena. It was the fact that I made it that far. And I'm like, what's the limit, man? Like if this is, you know, so, uh, and so it was really good. Um, you know, I, you talk about the guys that were getting out left and right, right? Uh, there were a lot of people getting out. There was some really good talent at the time. The op tempo was was high. I think the 75th op tempo is always going to be high. Yeah. Um, you'll hear me say this again, I'm sure, in this podcast, but you, you got to give something to get something, man. That's you right. want to be the best? Well, you're going to give up some time. Um, and and I'll be completely honest with you, that jived with the way, like that rhyme with the way I was raised as a kid. My Again, I didn't have much. But I was taught respect, hard work. You want to be somebody in life, you got to work hard for it. You know, um, you know, be cordial. Don't lie. Tell the truth. If something's wrong, say something. Don't hold it. You know, I, like very basic knowledge as a kid that really resonated with me. And I, it, it was like it complimented being in the 75th. I was addicted, man. Yeah, and so sure. I was I was, I, a, I was married the first time, you know, and I, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, I was 20. She was 18. And I married her. A great girl you know, just got married for the wrong reasons. I missed her. You know what I mean? Great lady. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, uh, she started not liking, uh, the op tempo and everything. And that's, and that's probably my fault. Actually, I know it's my fault. Um, cause I got it right the second marriage. Um, uh, but that was my fault. Um, and you know, I actually was going to try to be a police officer in New Orleans after my first enlistment. Um, and, uh, and so I went down there to go look at the uh, opportunities down as a police officer and uh, it didn't something didn't shake out and I decided to stay. Um, and then that's when I stayed and I reenlisted. Um, that's when I knew uh, when I raised my right hand, that was it. That was it. It was final answer. Because I'm like, I'm not going to reenlist again and then get out like that was that was final answer. Um, you know, I gave up some stuff too, like, you know, you're on an OML for schools and stuff like that. And when I mentioned that I wasn't going to uh, I may not stay in, I lost some of that uh, cred on that. But um what was it like, you know, to answer the question, what was it like in the nineties? You know, it was awesome. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I've served with some really like hardcore people, man, like an in, in Ranger regiment, like both, both in third range of battalion and first battalion, first range of battalion and 75th headquarters. But the nineties, man, like they were hard. And, and what I mean by that is that like, they were hard, not because the guys, the guys today could do what those guys did. But the guys back then did what they did. And I'm talking about, you know, sleeping in the woods, you know, in the winter, you know, where like most infantry soldiers, you know, would probably put up a tent or whatever. Right. No, man, we were living in foxholes. Or, you know, we were digging, you know, fighting positions uh, in the rain, you know, with extreme discipline. Right. You know, with like one man sleeping, one man up, no snivel gear, because if you got to move, you'll get hot. Like, I mean, it was hard, man. And you had McChrystal with the 20 and 30 mile walks. You know, um, I mean, we jumped out of airplanes all the time. I mean, all the time. You know, we were jumping out of airplanes all the time. We would jump in, you know, somewhere on, you know, at one of the at the airfield on bidding and then walk back. You know, if we were going to the range that was then within eight miles or so, we'd walk to it. We didn't drive. We walked to the range. You know, it was just it was it was different times. And I think it was also they were the elite infantry at the time. Yeah. By definition, they were elite infantry at the time, and they bought some. They brought something to the army um, better than anybody else can do. I mean, you know, it's like the charter, man. Better like wherever we go, you know, it's going to be apparent that we're the best, and we do it best with our hands. And they were the epitome of that. Yeah. Um, and again, it's not. It's not that the, the Rangers today are not capable of it. Their mission is different. It was just that at that time, and the things you had to endure to maintain the title of the Ranger was unlike. It was. It was insane. It was hard. Yes, it was very hard. Um, and they in the 90 op tempo was in my mind. The, op, the operational tempo in my mind was perfect. We didn't have computers. Um, 
you know, we didn't have the interferences of everyday data and collection, yeah. all the stuff we have today. It was repetition after repetition. We didn't leave, you know, we didn't leave until it was done right. Yeah. You know, we, we just never did. You didn't leave because it was Friday. So yep. You're like, no, you left. When, we'll go on a Saturday if you have to. You know, like we did it till it was good. Um, it, it was good times, man. And I think it was a great time uh, to be in the Army. And I, to be completely honest with you, you know, I think the invasion of Iraq was a testament to how good the Army was overall, um, how, how well trained they were. Uh, I, I would I would assume there's a lot to be learned in looking at how we trained back then. So, yeah. Dude, yeah. I, I love everything you said there. We're going to dig into it a little bit more as our yeah, first sorry, off script thing. So <laughs> yeah. I, I, I liked how you said you know, it was awesome. And I yeah. feel the exact same way when I think about my pre 9-11 time in regiment, even though it was small. That yeah. was some of the most formative time I have had in the military, learning about leadership and watching leaders do things when they were training for the unknown. Like yep. that was an amazing, it was awesome. I loved that time in the military. And on the flip side, all the people that were getting out and now, you know, when I fast forward where I was a first sergeant and people were getting out because they weren't going to war and doing the things, I would just be straight with them. I say, I don't think you're here for the right reasons, man. Like, yeah. it's not all about combat and do it. It's about more than that, more than your selfish desire to go to combat. This, this organization, this army is not, that's not what it's about. Right. There's a lot right. more to it. And I, and the last thing I'll say is the, the op tempo is it was crazy back then. They were, they were doing a lot of really cool things. Right. Oh, yeah. When you talk to the people that were on 9-11 from 175 that were out of the country doing training events and going to you go to Egypt and there was a lot of opportunity to do really cool things in the military. And I think, guys, some guys today think that just because the war's over, there's not going to have opportunity to do cool guy things or stuff, but there's actually more opportunity to do things that things those recruiters told you and so forth. So I just want you, if you'd comment on that a little bit. Yeah, I'll tell you something, Yumo, and I never understood this. I, I, I learned it inherently from the guys in the nineties, man. I, I, I was lucky enough. We showed up in November, 93, the rip class right after they got back. And uh, I went to second platoon, Bravo company, three, seven, five, you know, Jason Coleman, Derek Van Boot, Silver Star Awardees, man. They were my team leader, my squadron. Right. I don't know if they knew they were doing this. Um, but they were they were putting on display all the lessons learned from Mogadishu plus prior to that. And they were driving it in us, man, like never before, you know, like as training goes. And, and then I, I think I'm pretty sure, you know, I hope my 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 squad there that I was there would receive, you know, say the same reciprocate the same about myself. But I. To, to further define that as a senior leader in the army, um, deterrence is the ultimate weapon. Deterrence, preparedness, right? I mean, like, I'm not going to go fight Mike Tyson, man. Like, no way. I'm not going to do it. You know, like, you know, I'll get my ass kicked, right? And so when you train, when you train like no other, right? And you prepare yourself and, you, and you're able to bring on the combat power, all the combat power they have to bear, like nobody else, you know, people like there's other, the other people, there are enemies, adversaries get scared, man. Yeah. And, and I think we missed a mark. And I talked about that often uh, in my last, you know, two organizations I was in actually three uh, where I talked about why, you, you know, tough, realistic training. Um, you know, again, the guys from the nineties and, 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 and there's a lot of leads out there doing it today, but they really, I was lucky enough to fall into combat vet, you know, company and they drove home the importance of tough, realistic, you know, training and that you make the most unimaginable conditions known to man come to life in training so that you're prepared for it in combat. Right. And not only that, um, you train like you fight, man. Yeah, so there is no, don't, don't say good job if it's not a good job. You know, you, you know, I don't know people get their feelings hurt. So, you know, you can't say, Hey, you suck. You know, it's different times, but you can sure say like, Hey guys, you know, uh, you know, decent effort, not the best. We got some work to do. You're still telling it, you know, at least you're not saying good job because when you, I mean, you'd have told me good job as a young NCO or a young soldier. I'd have walked away, like pat myself on the back. Good job. I mean, and that's, and, and some of that transparency is missing today. We go back to the transparent leadership. One of the toughest parts of being a, a transparent leader is, is telling the truth. Yeah. Like telling the truth, even if it makes you unpopular, making the unpopular decisions, decisions, for the best of the organization and for the survival of your men. 
And I'll be completely honest with you, man. I started adopting this thing where like, I don't care um, if I, if you think I'm nice or not. I mean, I want to, I want to be friendly. I, I, I was always approachable, but I wasn't there to make friends, man. You know, my team leader and squad leader wasn't there to be my friend. They were there to save my life. Right. In the lives of others. You know, our mission, if you open up uh, ADP one, you know, we exist to fight and win our nation's war. That's that's its own. It's, it's it. It doesn't matter the MOS. And so that should drive all everything we do in the Army, everything that should be the very first thing. You know, it's kind of like when you start out a, a day at the CQB house and you do the safety brief. Remind them, you know why you exist? You know, you're a logistic, you're, you know, you're a mechanic. You're about to go work on a truck today. Open up the day. You know why you exist? Yeah, you may be turning wrenches, but it's contributing to fight and win our nation's war. You're a soldier first, you know, and, and so you're a ranger first. And um, and I think, you know, um, a lot of that was it wasn't said aloud because it was already happening in the 90s today. Yeah. And because of the, you know, what's the what's the cost of GWAT? Right. Like, you know, what is the cost of GWAT? I think we're talking about some of it right now. And I think we need to I think we need to define it. We need to define the cost of GWAT. And, and, and some things were lost. Let's be honest. Um, and, and, and the hard talks were lost. You know, we've lost some efficiencies. Uh, we've lost some of the hard talks. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, you know, some things are not defined like the way they used to be. Right. Um, and I'm not mad at our, like the best army is always in the making, man. I'm a loyalist to the, my army through and through, man. If they call me today, I'd go back, you know, if they needed me, uh, you know, I mean, I cut it at 30 for a reason, but if they ever needed me, like needed me, I'd go back. Um, and I would do whatever I could. Um, our commitment um, is to our commitment ties to being tr transparent and honest. You know, if I have an agenda or if I have a, a self worth to where I want to get promoted or whatever else, I'm going to steer away from being uh, transparent. Um, you know, but, you know, at the end of the day, the power of the 90s, I'll be honest with you, was that uh, we weren't in a hurry. We weren't in a hurry in the 90s. Um, I mean, I was I joined in 93, you know, and in 01. So I got a good bit. Uh, I'm semi certified to talk about it, you know, seven years ish. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Seven years of it and repetition. You know, if I look, do I think we would be as advanced as we are today if GY didn't happen? Absolutely not. Um, do I think we'd be prepared for anything to happen? You better believe it. Yeah. We'd be yeah. damn prepared. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. again, you got to give something to get something, man. Yeah. You know, um, so uh, we rapidly evolutionized our military to do things. Um, whereas, you know, Today, um, and this is not bad mouth than anything, I feel like we're more of a jack of many trades, you know, masters of none. Um, and I'll use the example of just go look at a motor pool. 100%. Go look at a motor pool, man. Look at all the crap we got, but we never did increase the MTO to support it. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, try to do maintenance on that and continue to do the mission we used to do. Yeah. Like, no, it's insane, you know. Yep. Um, yep. And so. And that's being transparent. Uh, I'm like, again, I'm a loyalist, man. But, you know, my job as an NCO and a sergeant major was to tell the hard truth, man. Yeah. Okay? You, you are the voice of the masses and officers do their damnedest to make the best decisions based on information. They call them informed decisions. The worst thing you can do is worry about his feelings. Yeah. The best thing you can do is tell him the truth. You know, you know, that's that's just that. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I agree 100%. And there's a, there's people that listen to this podcast that don't have any military background. And sometimes they're like, yeah. how does this translate to the military? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share an example and if you give some thoughts on it. But yeah. train how you fight, train hard. I'm an avid football fan. Watch a lot of NFL football. And I've Absolutely. been watching early in the season this year, a lot of teams struggling. And then I hear the coaches come back and say, yeah, we're struggling. We didn't have a harder training camp. We didn't go as hard as we should have in training camp. We didn't hold the standard. I wish I would have played my players in the preseason. And then I look at the teams that are crushing it right now that have like the 49ers, have the Mike Shanahan old school mentalities where you train how you fight. They got John Lynch in there. They got a different mentality that they brought, you know, they brought it. And it, it translates across all industries, all professions, work ethic and doing things the right way and try not to be nice and, 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 and coddle people and do things. Yeah. It transcends outside the military to everything you do in your life. And I just wonder if you've got something to say on that before we move on. Yeah, man. So uh, I got the sun coming here. I get off my face a little bit. So I'll say, you know, it's, you know, excuse my language. Right. But I was told once early, 
uh, you can't throw shit at the wall and hope it sticks. Right. I mean, you can, and here was another one. You can't polish a turd, right? Yeah. You know, you, you just can't. Um, I'll tell you what I've learned as a trainer in the army and I you know, and maybe one day I can do this for somebody else out there in the big world, you know, uh, given the latitude. Um, if you think actions on the objective, which basically the execution of your training is the more, most important uh, part of training, you're wrong. Yeah. You're 100% incorrect, but you'll see a lot of trainers today. And it's again, something else that's lost uh, with GWAT. You'll see a lot of people today that are conducting preparedness put more effort into the execution than the preparation of the execution. Yep. All right. And so you'll, the MDMP process captures this, the detailed planning, right? All right. There's a reason why it's gruesome. Uh, it's because you have to go into extreme detail. Now you I'll, I'll say this aloud uh, based on some observations. Um, you want to make a plan. You better have the best experienced people making your plan. Otherwise your plan, no matter how many hours you throw at it, again, you can't throw something at the wall and hope it sticks. You know, it's not, it has nothing to do with time. It's qualitative, quantitative stuff, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll simple it down, you know, in the army. And I know you said some people, so now, you know, the audience in the army, we do these things called live fires, right? And the soldiers go across the objective, but someone's got to set up the objective. Right. And if you do it right. Um, and if you have like, you may have role players and people that act like civilians on the battlefield and everything else. So there's a scenario that goes with it. The best train I've ever seen is when we put the best trainers on backside support to support that train and make sure that the role players knew their roles, the lines of fire are correct. The sectors of, you know, the homes are the, the, the scenarios are placed and it replicated the actual mission we we're going to do. And so we, we, you know, we miss that a lot. And again, something else lost. I wouldn't say just in the army, but probably today with the op tempo that we have in the world today is that, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a course right now at Excelsior. It's a project management course, you know, and, and uh, you know, the preparation, is, I mean, it, even that it's, it's a little summarized and I'm like, ah, you know, it could be a lot more details, uh, it, it, you know, in there, um, you know, to prep for this project. Um, I, I mean, if you, it's also the repetition of that because the more you've, operate that way the more you can visualize and and what i consider one of my strengths is to predict unforecasted complexities right ahead of time and i'm a, i was an advisor for commanders in the army one of my jobs was not was to understand his vision and what he wanted to do and then go look at the force look at the training path and then forecast complexities or friction and yeah. get to the left of that before they happen and, and put motion put things in motion uh, to, to, to reduce risk. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. I mean, um, so you're absolutely correct. You, I mean, like, um, yeah, man, I mean, the, the training aspect, um, I, I think it would be the same in any business. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I just talked to, a, a, um, somebody from black rifle the other day and, uh, he was, he was telling me he's a prior Marine. And I said, Hey man, I said, uh, what's corporate world like? He goes, it's very similar he goes, you're a sergeant major in the army. I'm like, yep. He goes, he goes, you do just well. You'll be yeah. fine. He goes, it's extremely similar. His challenge is exactly, you know, getting people to think efficiently or, or find efficiencies uh, in, in the thing and then actually making decisions based on information. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you give two COAs, they can't make a decision, go back, refine, refine, refine. He goes, man, it, you know, we'll be more profitable if you just make a decision and we build, which is kind of the new way to do projects today. Uh, it's yeah. kind of a, it's kind of a hybrid approach to projects. Yeah. Um, you get it going and get feedback and continue to refine. Um, but yeah, man, um, again, another subject I could talk on all day as a trainer, uh, but I yeah. pride myself, I pride myself on that. And I think some of the traits that we're wanting back in the army existed in the army uh, in the nineties. Uh, yeah. They exist today. A lot of, you know, I said this at one of my uh, change of responsibility speeches. I mean, there's a lot of people asking a lot of questions, Go read doctrine. It's the answers are in there. <laughs> you just got to apply uh, and you got to reprioritize. Um, there is a such thing as doing too much. Yeah. Uh, however. So, yeah. I, yeah, I love what you're saying there about reading doctrine and stuff. I, I remember when I was a platoon sergeant, we were doing the, uh, a live fire, a uh, breach of mind wire obstacle done it a thousand times. And I immediately yeah. pulled out the manual and I said, let's read the manual. Let's just read it. Let's yeah. see what it says. Let's let's why? Because you got to go back to the basics sometimes or all the time, in my opinion, before you can build on it. And yeah, you know, that kind I, of I got, caveat, yeah, go. I want to comment on the doctrine part. Um, the doctrine today in the army does read a little weird. 
it's a little more college like. Um, and in other words, it leaves a lot to be interpreted. And that's great. But you got to understand if you don't have a base already of knowledge, it becomes very confusing. And I'll quote uh, 3-21.8. It says the commander is the primary trainer of an organization. Now, if I'm a young lieutenant, right, coming into a platoon, a, a, a second lieutenant, and there's a, a 12-year platoon sergeant, you think that's going to fly if he's going to start practicing? No way, man. Even as even as some of the young company commanders and these, you know, these, you know, you got 18, 15 year first starts out there. It's not going to fly. And so doctrines change a little bit. You know, the, it, in my in my opinion, commanders are ultimately responsible for all that happens in an organization and training to be included. But the primary trainer is a senior NCO of the organization. He is overall responsible. So why is that important to Al? Why is it important to me? Because today you go in a company and you'll see a lot of first sergeants behind a computer, yeah. right? Typing up data and everything else, right? Or platoon sergeants because of the requirements of the army. Today. We've become a, a very digital army. And if, again, people take stuff literal sometimes. If that stuff needs to be put in doctrine, hey, man, yeah. first sergeant, you are the primary trainer of the company. You belong at training, right? Delegate delegate X to the officers or the, or the lieutenants in the platoon. Let them fill data or your training room. Like we need to get like, – in order to get back to the basics, some of the basics need to be codified in today's doctrine. Yeah. You know, 7-8 was a beautiful thing. And so was 7-7 yeah. Juliet for all for all the Met guys out there. Yep. As an infantryman, I read that too. So when you say that, the uh so uh everybody, it's a joke, right? Calling you top when you're the first art. Like it's a yeah. big joke, right? And I yeah. told my guys one time, I was like, I don't care if you call me top. Do you know what it means? Yep. It means I'm the trainer of personnel. Yep. I say that's who I am. That's yeah. what I do. I train you guys. I, you can call me top all you want because that's what I am because I understand what it means and where it came from and the responsibility that goes with that term to me. That's a term of endearment, not a not a slight against who I am as a ranger leader. So it's interesting how how sometimes we things like that get misconstrued, and misunderstood. Yeah, you, you know it's interesting. You know, the uh, I what am I again as an advisor? Right, you look down at the force and you got to be honest. Again, if you want to be efficient, you got to be honest. Uh, you don't you. you you hope to be popular, but the honest person typically isn't, right? Right, hundred percent. And so I go, you know, I go look at some of these. Uh, I'm like, hey, you know, I, I you know, uh, had an organization. I'm like, hey, man, we need to implement a team leader course. Why? Oh, you know. So we, so anyway, we did a team leader course. We started going at it, and then I was like, hey, can I see your POI? <laughs> and uh, it just, it just wasn't. Uh, again, you, you know, I'll, I'll quote uh, Oh, Sergeant Major Ralph Beam. You know, don't expect, but you don't inspect. You know, so I, I did my inspections, looked at the POI. And, um, and it wasn't to, to what I believe need to be established in the organization. And the number one thing I told them, I was like, hey, man, I'll, I'll open up your team litter course because, you know, I'm the, I'm the primary, I'm the senior listed advisor, you know, for the, for the brigade. Um, so please invite me. Uh, I said, but the very first thing I want you to talk about is roles, duties, and responsibilities of the individual. Like we need to re blue on those things. There's a lot of confusion right now. Um, with roles and responsibilities and what the priorities are as an NCO. Um, yeah. And I won't, you know, and that's just, and I'll speak on behalf of the NCOs because, you know, not only did I see it, but also um, I've heard some folks talk about it. And again, uh, again, not bad mouth in the army. I think we're going through some changes in the army and we'll get it back. Um, but you won't hear that often. Right. And uh, it needs to be said aloud so we can get it right. Yeah. Um, we we got to get it right. Um, right. There's our soldiers, join the army for a reason people mm -hmm. volunteer to be leaders for a reason and if they don't get it the talent's gone the the people today are not stupid man um, they're not dumb and, and so if, if their expectations are not met they're either going to go crazy or they're going to quit yeah. they're not going to stay committed um the, at least the best i was always told the best ones get out yeah. you know uh, so but anyway yeah. yeah, I agree. And the way it always goes in these podcasts and conversations is we answer some of the questions as we go, but I'm going to revisit one, even though we've answered some of it. So you've seen, you know, you saw the evolution of the army and the regiment pre 9-11, post 9-11. Uh, I think there's stuff to be learned from that pre 9-11 time that we don't focus on enough. And wish was more in today's modern military, if you will. Is there any, any of those, any of those things that you haven't already covered that you wish, you know, we did a little bit more of now? That we did pre 9-11. Yeah. I'll speak, I'll speak the I'll speak from the Sergeant Major of uh, me first, and then I'll speak from the from the heart. Without knowing what's ahead of us, our next adversary, 
you know, uh, right. And what, what's in front of us uh, as a nation, it's kind of hard to answer that question. I mean, cause that's ultimately um, we always train for our priorities. And so you shape the force based on that. I think the army's going through that right now. I think they discovered some gaps in their swing and uh, we're, we're going through that right now. And, and I, and I, it's, it's a beautiful sight to realize that you're, you know, you've been a part of a, a great organization that understands um, when they needed to, to adjust, right. Uh, to become, you know, you know, I guess profitable in their, and in, in what they stand for, right. As an organization. Um, however, um, we move really fast today. I mean, real fast. And uh, the, the pro to that is that because we move fast, so does our adversaries. They got to keep up with us, right? The con to that is that we may be missing some um, some efficiencies uh, or some standalone items that we need to put in our kit bag and keep forever as a military, right? And so, you know, quite frankly, um, speaking from the heart, you know, and, and Al, what he thinks, uh, we need to slow down, man. We, we need to slow down. You know, the army does, uh, sometimes they do these things like if somebody gets killed and trained or something like that or whatever they do, they like the stand down day, right? You got a mandatory training, right? <laughs> yeah, with the utmost respect, um, I think we need to do that as an army. Right. Like we just need to stop. I, I think some of our, uh, I think some of our folks, and, and I know they're having these, I, I know they're getting after it. Uh, but I think at some at some point, you know, maybe it's divisions and below. We need to stop and look around and and like like look at our, you know, I don't want to call it a business model, but it's kind of what it is. Look at our model and say, are we efficient? Um, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And if they were to call me today and say, hey, man, um, what like what do, what are we doing wrong? What can we fix? I, right off the bat, I tell me measuring. Like, I, I know if you don't if it's not measured, it doesn't get managed. I know that. Right. But you got echelons like there's too much data going up. There's too much data going up. You know, one of the most. Um, I, I had a, I had a, a John Cogbill, man. He was an awesome commander when I was in Rock 7, right? Former Ranger. Um, and we were ramping up for the North Korea thing. And uh, we started talking and uh, General Milley came over. He's like, you guys got to be ready to go, you know, and do this and do that. You know, he gave us a mission. And I was like, and it was the first time in my career um even after, even even post G, like even after G one time in the Rangers, where I, I felt this urgency, like, holy crap, man, something something like really big is about to happen, right? And it like re-energized my purpose, and I really started going home at night. And I was literally losing sleep, saying, "Hey, what advice? What words? What suggestions can I give my commander um, for this upcoming training cycle that we have, and for GRTC, um, you know, to make us." combat ready as an organization. Uh, and then of course, what can I do as myself? Well, as myself in front of men, you know, in front of soldiers, the men and women out there, like, you know, even the commander, I always did my best to try to paint a vivid picture of what I forecasted would be our mission. And I would sell it as best as I could. And I would try to bring that home every day, again, making them understand what they're for in this time and place during that time, you know what you're for today when you go out training, right guys? You know, you know, I mean, you got nearly 5,000 people out there around you in a microphone it becomes a really powerful thing. Um, but for my commander, I started thinking about, you know, visualizing, you know, and he was as well, like what, what this would go down. And I was comparing to like, you know, when you're not in, when you're not in combat, your sets and reps are in garrison. Yeah. Mainly like you're, you're mainly in garrison. You know, the, the, I would say it's probably training versus garrison right now. We're probably two thirds garrison, one thirds training. Right. And so inherently the habits you create in garrison will bleed into combat. So I look at the way we communicate, man, we, we, we know too much. We don't, we know too Like why does anybody above a battalion, all right, need to know private produces PT score. I, I don't know. I mean, cause like what's going to happen when you go to combat, right? You're going to ask a commander say, Hey, um, what's going on the objective. And you, you got to trust his word. Yeah. You have to. Right. You have to trust the commander's word on the ground. So why would you not trust it in garrison? Um, and so that 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 puzzles me. Um, it puzzles me um, because I think it creates this era of distrust amongst leaders. And I think some of it's because of the risk adverse. Right. And so you try to measure everything to try to be risk adverse. But then it also the, the you know, the byproduct of that is a, a foundation or a culture of distrust. Um, 
I mean, look, you can strive for perfection all you want. It's just going to, it's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, it, th- you should perfect the things that matter, right? You should try to perfect the things that matter. And I, I use this. We were given, I'll use this. Um, and again, I'm not bad mouth in the army. I'm just looking at some ways we can gain efficiencies. We would send up medical status like weekly of our organization. But you know what you do when you deploy right before you deploy? You SRP, <laughs> you SRP, you know, and if, and if it's the, you know, if it's the big one, we're all going regardless what your teeth looks like. Yep. And so I, I go back to the nineties, you know, we SRP would once a year. That was our readiness for medical. That was it. And then everything else is handled by the medics. You know, people, people were this and that and the other, and we got measured, you know, but it wasn't as, as it wasn't as like, it's just, it's just a lot of metrics being measured, man. Um, the other thing uh, that I'll say is the NCOES. Uh, now there's, there may be a reason for this. And again, I remember being deployed to Iraq, I'm sorry, Afghanistan. And uh, it was Sergeant Major Troxel to come down. And uh, when he was up there, you know, and uh, he's like, hey, you know, chief thinks that uh, team leaders should be, um, he thinks there are many ambassadors on the battlefield. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, we all are. We're all ambassadors, right, for our country. You know, we're ambassadors for the United States up there. But he also thought that, um, they should be able to execute mission command. And I was like, well, they're, they're certainly, uh, they're certainly smart enough uh, to execute mission command, but I, they, but they didn't go through the school that like the, our officers do. Right. And so, um, okay, I, I got it, you know, mission command at the team level. Um, but what does that mean for the, ins- and so, so the, the beauty of that is great. I'm not going to I'm not going to ding that. Right. Because I understand the concept of it. And maybe it was for the time and what we were doing over there with coin. But then but then what does that do to the NCO core? Right. Because who's going to get their hands dirty now? If a team leader is focusing on, you know, being educated and understanding, them, you know, the way that play, like so who is going to get like that team leader couldn't be him if somebody was already getting you know, investing in them. So so how does that work for the NCO core? So I I. I I'll go back to the to NCOES right now. Yes. Great. You know, NCOs are getting a college degree. Um, what's the cost? Right. I mean, like, what's the cost? I mean, it could be a rhetorical question. I think some of it is that they become self-absorbed. Right. And they, I mean, like, I, mean, I went to the academy, Star Majors Academy, and there were some folks in there with like two doctor's degrees. And I'm like, when did you have the time to do that? Like, like, I mean, like literally, and it could be an MOS discrepancy, right. Or something, but like, I never had the time to do that. I mean, I invest, I, you know, and we'll talk about balance in a little bit, but like the free time I had was to, for me, my, my sanity and my family. I didn't have time to do school. I would, if I was knocking out that kind of school, I could have never invested in my, my folks the way I should have. Yep. Um, to be honest with you, you know, um, I, I think, I think if I could go back in time, man, we just need to sit. We need to simplify some stuff. Um, efficiency, brevity. Um, there's a lot of that uh, going. You know, I heard somebody one time giving advice on the calendar. If you put something on, take something off. You put something on the calendar, take two things off. Now I could go back in time, man. There's a lot of stuff on calendars right now. There's not a lot that came off. Yeah. Um, and I think some of that. And I, I hear, I hear the upper echelons of leadership telling commanders: assume risk, assume risk, assume risk. Right. Figure it out. You guys got it. And, and they're right. They need to. But what if they don't know? Yeah. What if they don't have the confidence because they've never done it? So, so I'll say this. I've read a lot of doctrine and a lot of army manuals and stuff like that. Right. But I didn't emulate those. I just didn't. Yeah. I emulated my leaders. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. Right. Remember, doctrine is just a base. Doctrine's base knowledge, and then you create additional TTPs and avenues and everything else off of that. It's just the base. I always emulated my leaders. And then I started to look, you know, open my aperture and I look at everybody else around me. And I started looking more and more and grabbing the goods and bads. Like, don't do that. That's a great example of what not to do. Do that. But like at the end of the day, I never emulated doctrine, Yuma. I never did. I always emulate my leaders. And so if we tell our commanders to assume risk and they've never seen it or they get their hands slapped when they do, I mean, it's yeah. it's tough. And this is the heart. And look, man, I was hired for a reason. My commanders always appreciated these conversations with them. And so there's no repercussions for that as a sergeant major. This is what we should do. We should talk a lot. It's not being disloyal. It's being honest. Yeah. Our, our general officers in the Army are starving, 
starving for the right informed information to make the best informed decisions. The in between is the problem. Yeah. Right. There's so much data. There's so much data. It's like, you know, like, and then, and so staff become staff, staffs become data miners. They're not even doing staff work. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and, and make no mistake, there's a good chance that some of that data is not even accurate because they're trying to meet time hacks. You're right. And then you make right. decisions off inaccurate data, right? Yep. So. Yeah. Again, another topic we could probably talk a whole episode on yeah. there, but a, a, a couple of things, right? This translates again, I think, directly to the business world where corporations or businesses are moving too fast, then they can do things. They're, and I always say, you know, it's an army acronym, SEALs. Stop, look, listen, and smell. Sometimes you just got to say stop. You just got to stop and look around and see what's going on and, and, and take the time to understand. Because you're right, information is overload in both spectrums, civilian world and, and the military. Uh, we're moving so fast. We don't empower people. Everybody thinks they need to know everything. And that's kind of the way we are in this day and age, this social media day and age. Everybody wants to have their hand in the pot. Uh, but I've had conversations with people before about this podcast and other things I've done. And they say, hey, man, you're you can't say you shouldn't say that you're talking bad about the regiment. You're talking bad about the army. And I go, am I wrong in what I'm saying? If I'm wrong, tell me. And they all say, well, you're not wrong, but I don't know if you should say it. And I go, we got to get past this, this, you know, protect at all costs, the so, name, the brand. If we don't talk about these things, we're never going to get better. It's like, an take, a, gonna, like the old fashioned AAR. If you go to my LinkedIn page, I have this thing about unicorns. Right. I wrote that. I made it up. Right. It, and basically what it says is that, um, you know, we want the most talented leaders. Right. And so we drive them in. And, and, I, and I talk about the unicorn, what he had to do back in the day to be a unicorn and what he's expected to do today. It's insane what a unicorn employee or a soldier is supposed to do today. Yeah. And one of the things we're supposed to do is we're supposed to give feedback. Right. We're, they want I want bottom up refinement. Well, man, it, I'm going to give you information, but don't get on to me when I tell you what you don't want to hear. Again, some of the best commanders I've ever had, they're like, they'll say it aloud. They're like, hey, I don't want to be surrounded by like-minded individuals. I want to be surrounded by people, right, that tell me, you know, like unbiased, tough information. So I gather all this information, whether, you know, in life, like life, much less business isn't strawberry and rainbows. We need to collect the data that's that's, you know, if you're inefficient as an organization or a business, chances are you're not getting the right information. Right. Um, and so you need to put the right talent in place to get you that information. There's some there's a lot of again, I'll go back to the self-absorbed stuff. Um, some folks are in position and they're super talented, but then they get comfortable and they become self-absorbed with their own agenda to maintain their position. Versus what's best for the organization, and I think the army's doing a good job of trying to figure that out. They got that 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 catalyst or that that uh the uh, that thing going up there in Leavenworth. Um, it's never going to be perfect, but the other thing we got to stop doing is we got to stop chasing all these. There's bright and shiny, shiny objects every day getting thrown at us. Programs and you know what? Um, what I've discovered, innovation is great, and I'm all about it. Right, innovation is doing something that's never done before, but so is creativity. Yes. And it's probably it's probably got more. Well, it's probably got less risk and it's probably going to give you more profit in most in most circumstances. Right. And so your bright, shiny object is probably something you need to pick up and dust off. You know, yeah. at least in my opinion, um, you know, the old saying, again, I go back to the 90s. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That has nothing to do with with the evolution of thinking broad. Right. That has nothing like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That has nothing to do with close being closed minded. That means that it works. They didn't say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. No, no. Keep looking for innovative ideas and ways to get better and more efficient. But we're not going to change until this is vetted. Right. Right. I mean, look at the ACFT, for instance. Bright, shiny object. Look what's going on right now. Yeah. Ask them. Ask me. Right. Ask any of the sergeant majors that I know if we were asked our opinion on that. We weren't. The primary trainers in the army. We weren't. Right. right. And so again, I'm not bad mouthing the army, but that's not efficient. You know how much additional, you know, how much, like how much work, how much work was lost? The army was without a fitness test for a year. Like that is the most inefficient thing I've seen in a long time. And again, this is not bad mouth in the army. This is being completely honest. I hope we never, ever do anything like that again. Right. And 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 so I, I have to be the transparent leader right up front. And, and I'm loyal. I never once said these words in front of my formation. And I won't, you know, um, but this. 100% because this is my way of giving back. 
and being right. honest, you know, right. but, but where, where do we stop? Where does it stop when it, when it, with these attempts? Again, no risk, no reward, but man, that was a huge risk. That wasn't, that wasn't properly vetted. Yeah. Um, and to be completely honest with you, in my opinion, we need to go back to the three event PT test. You want to be hard then drop the standards, make it like it was in the nineties, 82 pushups, 92 sit-ups and 1154 to max a PT test on the two mile run. And if you're a ranger, you had to do six pull-ups. Yep. Those were, that was hard. It's not easy to do. Right. You know, and oh, by the way, the three event PT test was good for Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. You know, make, make the ACFT a supplemental gauge. That's what we do in the regiment in the 75th. I think the Marine Corps has something like that. Um, and so, and that's, a, and that's being honest and efficient. So you get, you get, you get your ACFT, the dollars are not lost and you still get the efficiency of having an additional means of training and preparation. Yeah. I agree. But, I agree. And, I, and I'm not, I'm not, again, not disloyal, man. This is completely honest. I would say these exact words if I was summoned to go speak in front of the highest levels in the army. Right. But isn't that what we're supposed to do? hundred percent. Yep. It makes me 100%. wonder if, they, if it's not being done. It's, it's, it's just really interesting. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So if, when you look back at your time in the 75th or in the army and, and you're talking to somebody who's thinking about joining the military, what, how did that, how did the 75th Army shape you as a leader and a person for who you are today? Well, I, I tell you, I had I had a perspective while serving in the 75th, um, and then when I went big Army uh, out to the out there, and you know, and it was it was an honor and it was awesome. Um, my perspective changed. Um, so, how did the 75th um, change me as a person? I'll answer that first. Um, it doubled down on the things in life that are important for me. Um, you know, discipline, uh, a fit, like, you know, efficiency. That's like my number one thing. I, we went to the Sergeant Majors Academy. I'm sorry, to the uh, pre-command course, uh, you, you up at Leavenworth, you go, you go twice and both times, man, one of them was brevity and one of them was efficiency on, on a Saturday they make you do all, they give you all these cards and then you, you dial them down to like 10 and you dial them down. And like one time it was, efficiency and the other time was brevity um that's that's like my number one thing man and so um you know it kind of jives with my character and and uh and so the 75th is exactly that i think it's another reason man. we were always efficient brevity you know like we were we, you know we wouldn't dwell on things that weren't like that weren't getting us gains um but as a person um it gave me strength man and confidence uh you go through levels of success and failures while there um, and everyone around you is hyper competitive. And so, um, if my capacity is 100, um, they push me to 110 because it was so competitive. I mean, if you're in a non-competitive environment, chances are you're not going to, you're not going to get competitive. Um, and so, and you're not going to push yourself. I mean, we all have, um, I say one of the traits of a ranger that most people uh, is, is their capacity. All right. We always train at max capacity, which at the end of the day, basically stretches your capacity. And so your capacity becomes more and more and more and more. And so I would say as a person training in the 75th, it doubled down on what I knew to be right when it comes to you know standards and discipline just in life. Um, you know, I'm a nice guy. I mean, I'll do anything for anybody, but like, you know, the things that keep me strong are the basics and they were really good at it. And then my capacity, I did not know what I was capable of as a person to take on, uh, both mentally and physically. Um, and the, the regiment not only showed me that, they increased my capacity by being there. It gave me the confidence, you know, and then as a, and again, as a person, I'll add just as a third, the appreciation for talent. Uh, I, you'll never get put in an environment. I'll never get put in an environment like that again. I don't think so, unless unless I hit it big somewhere, you know, in, in a talented corporate environment, you know what I mean? Like, but like, I really had an appreciation for the talent around me. I mean, I had to bring my A game to work every day. And you know what, you know, as a closet nerd myself, you know, I, you and I already talked, you know, 11 Bravo, no tattoos, build my own computer. Right. I, 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 I value intelligence. I'm not the smartest guy around, man. I never was. I never pretend to be, but I sure love conversations with people smarter than me and learning from them. And I, I miss that. Yeah. I, I really do, man. And like, that was a pull of those guys there, man, both the officers and the NCOs. I really miss that. Um, as a soldier, 
as an NCO, being there, it drove home the importance of preparedness and training, man. And it also showed me how to, it gave me structure when it came to planning, not just in training, but in life. I realized the importance of, of preparation. We just talked about this earlier, right? And the preparation you know, leads to great, you know, the right preparation leads to great execution and then follow through, follow your shot, you know, follow your shot in life. Um, and then reflect, you know, like the old FDEA, find, fix, finish, analyze, exploit. It's a cycle. But if you apply that to life, man, you know, it's a circle and you just keep doing that. And, uh, and so that's kind of one of the things I learned there as well um, as a soldier. And, and you know, um, I wish I'd have took on more when I was there. Yeah. It's like a, it, it's just like a treasure of knowledge. I wish I would have took, I wish I'd have volunteered more, took on more, took on more responsibility. I didn't, I didn't realize what I had until I left and make no mistake, man. When I went in the big army, um, I carried that scroll on my right shoulder proudly. And I had, you know, there's stereotypes out there. And so I had to prove the, you know, I had to prove the, the positive stereotypes to be true and the negatives to be false. Yeah. Uh, and so I did that. Um, yeah. And, you know, and then again, as a, you said, as a leader, I believe is what you, one of your questions you asked. Um, I think as a leader, uh, being a 75th, it was the importance of our mission as a nation. And, uh, and um, you know, I mean, it's not common. Like you go be a part of a task force, um, you know, in the Rangers, you get exposure to general officers and high level folks and everything else. I mean, Jesus, you know, that doesn't happen often in the big army. You know, you, like I mean, like some serious exposure to um intelligence and the whole nine yards, man. And so you start to see this, the seriousness of our mission as a military uh, in the 75th and what your, your role is um, as a soldier and a ranger. Um, and so that, that drove home a lot being there too. It, it, you know, so, you know, you just don't realize until again, until you leave. So. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. So the perfect segue into your time in the conventional army. So a lot of people, when you, a lot of rangers thinking about leaving the regiment that's like the worst thing for them they'd rather get out of the military than than leave the regiment and serve the conventional army but when i do talk to guys that have left it's the it's usually the opposite of what they thought it was going to be they say they met some of the best leaders they've ever met in their life in the conventional army yeah. it's not as bad as they thought it was going to be and they learned a lot about yeah. a different part of leadership that they didn't cultivate inside the 75th what was you spent almost half your career in the conventional force yeah you know after 17 years in the army and then you know another 15 in the conventional force close to it what was your conventional time like where are some of the you know the truths and the falses about serving yeah. in the conventional army i got to talk about this real quick first though you know it's, it's i call it the switch and it's one of the things that i try to teach you guys without them knowing i was doing it right that's one of the best ways to influence people when you're trying to get them to grow is to influence them without them knowing they're being influenced influenced the switch it's so like on target um I got to tell a quick story first. Uh, so when I was in DECO, uh, when I took over DECO 175 as the first sergeant, it was me and Mike Squires. Um, one of the things I was challenged with is I received uh, folks from different from different companies. Long story short, I was like, all right, I separated the NCOs, pulled them in the classroom, and I talked to them about expectations. Don't forget your legacy for the other companies. That's important, but we're building a legacy. And this company, I need your undivided attention. We're going to do things a little different, but a lot similar to what you've already done, right? Um with the soldiers or the, the the young rangers, I had them write down on a, on a, a three by five card some pointed questions, and um, one of the questions was, "What is a professional?" And so when I got done talking to them, I took the three by five cards and I brought them home. Look, you know, uh, some of the stuff that was on that card was really good, good, you know, uh, but some of it was questionable, very, <laughs> like, like you know what I mean, uh, very questionable. Um, and as a matter of fact, you don't know, man, what's in some people's heads. Right. But it was a really good way to gauge my audience. Uh, and so I realized I had to like reblue on the switch, you know, before you go on target, you know, you turn on this thing. You got to become a kind of alter ego, a different person. And when you leave target, you turn it off. OK. Um, and some people have a hard time with that because it's not taught the psychology of, you know, how to do that. Um, and And. You know, I, I, I'll put it like this, you know, and it, I, well, we'll talk about retirement later. But, you know, if a, lion, if a lion's been caged, right, you let him out to go attack and you put him back in a cage. Right. What happens? If you leave the cage open. You know what I mean? And so there's something to be said about that. So. So what does that mean about what your question? Well, you know, there's a switch. It's not combat related, but there's a different 
mentality you have to take on to be receptive um, in the army uh, out there. It's not the Ranger Regiment. That doesn't mean you can't bring what's good about the Ranger Regiment out there. Um, and it's, it's, I call it expectation management. You know, and so my standards never changed out there. Remember that, I mean, the 70, one of the 75th roles of the past was to make everybody better. Right. Um, so, um, and so, you know, the charter, man, I, I went out and did it. And so my switch was like, okay, my mental switch is like, I'm no longer, in, you know, special operations, no longer a ranger. I'm a leader in the army. And so I took my time in the Academy to kind of like visualize what kind of sar command sergeant major I wanted to be out there without knowing anything about the big army as much as, I, as much as my peers while in the Academy. Um, but I'll just, I'll just tell you this, man, once out front, uh, if you're a, 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 if you're a leader by definition, you know, uh, it comes out, I mean, you, you quickly find your place. Um, and boy, do they need you out there. They need leadership, um, selfless, authentic, mission focused leadership. Um, when they see you the very first time at the range and you walk out there and, and talk just a couple TTPs and they're like, it's like gold. They're like, holy cow, man, this is awesome. You know, and you, I mean, like it's so it's 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 it was awesome. You know, it was awesome. It, I've you know, it's 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 one thing when you know uh, you belong, but it's a whole different ball game when you're told it, you, that you, know, you belong and you're appreciated. And that's kind of how I felt that big army. I, I, like, you know, I felt like in the, in the Rangers, you know, I was always earning my stay. I know I was appreciated there. Right. Uh, I was earning my stay. But, you know, the attaboys or in, in the, accol the accolades, I mean, there's a lot of people that are on the same level as you. So it's hard. It's, you know, you got to go find some really. Um, and, and I think this is why Rangers are really intelligent. You got to When I say you got to bring your A game, man, if you want to you want to be a standout, you got to do something nobody's done. You got to say something. You got to go study. You know, you got to be educated. You, when the BC and the Sergeant Major sits down and you want to give contribution to the battalion, man, you better say something smart, you know. And so, you know, you go out in the big army, all those things paid off, man. I was able to bring these conversations out there. I loved it. Yeah. Um, I love my soldiers, man. I got I, I, I would do anything for them. And I and I saw and, and there's a lot of them out there that are capable of doing what we do in the Rangers that just never either believed in themselves, took the leap of faith. Or even, or, you know, the horror stories of the 75th, they never, you know, or the, you know, the, the fear of the unknown, I guess is probably a better way to say it. Um, so they steered away from it. Yeah. Plenty of capable folks out there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, but I'll, you know, never judge, you know, the importance of your, uh, you know, your impact on the fight based on the proximity. They all, we all have a role. The army exists the way it does for a reason. And it's, it's, it's actually, um, it's actually, you know, it's actually pretty efficient. And it means by the way it's designed, you know, right. what special right. operations role is and conventional. There's some stellar organizations out there, man, that are doing great things right now. Yeah. Yeah. I hope everybody enjoyed episode one of my conversation with Command Sergeant Major Retired Al Pertus. Uh, I'm sorry for the kind of abrupt ending that it had there. It was hard to find a place to stop uh, in the conversation to make this thing two episodes because our conversation was just going so fluid for two and a half hours, but I hope you'll tune in next week as we talk about leadership, uh, his transition out of the service, uh, being a husband and father, um, army NCO leadership. I mean, we're going to talk about a whole bunch more stuff in episode two, and I truly hope you, you tune in because there's a, there's a lot of value in, in this episode. Um, I always get asked, how can I support the uh, podcast, you know, what can I do? Uh, I don't put it out there often. I don't know why I, I need to practice what I preach and ask for help every once in a while. But, uh, this podcast does take a lot of work to do, uh, and, uh, I'm not making a fortune doing it. So if you want to support the podcast, you can go over to the Patreon link that I'll put down in the comments and you see it here, uh, and subscribe to, to be a, a, a Patreon member. And, and what does that do? That just helps me maintain all the equipment and all of the editing software and audio software and music software that I pay for to keep this podcast going. Uh, I appreciate your support and I understand completely if you can't support and you just want to want to listen. Fine with that too. I just wanted to give you the opportunity because I get asked often of how you could help. And uh, that's one way you can help. Uh, nobody likes to say it, but money rule, rules the world. Uh, it even it doesn't matter if you're in the nonprofit space or the benevolent space or you just, you know, the church space. Uh, unfortunately, cash is king. So if you want to help me out, 
I'd appreciate it. And like I said, if you can't, I fully understand. I got it. I'm going to keep doing this regardless. I'll catch you guys next week on episode two with Sergeant Major Albertus and uh, out here.